Listener, listener, thank you so much for joining us today. Sunday, the 24th of March, as we record this. Slightly different show for you on account of A, we're not in the studio, and B, we're just Daniel Story and Seb Stafford Blore. Hello to you both. Hi, James. Hello, Jimbo. Hello. I have to say, if I had to pick just two, just two to carry us through an international break, report, stroke, roundup, it would be Seb Stafford Blore and Daniel Story. That's lucky. But. Mm. Just to make sure, we're going to throw in a little bit of Tom Williams later on, and I think we might be getting a call from Christophe Terreur as well, which is always fun. Meantime, so let me ask you, where have you been and what you've been up to since we last spoke? I have been mainly in Germany. I've been watching mm. most recently a little bit of international football. I've been getting very invested in the in the coefficient, Jimbo, Yeah. generally. I, I didn't see that in my future, but actually I've become kind of... Uh, not sure there's a sort of a, a noun for someone that's interested in in coefficients. Well, there might uh, yeah. be, but it might be quite unflattering. There is, there is one. It's a coefficionado. Oof, nice. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I think it's on everyone's, every right th thinking person's mind that's not busily occupied with the little crosses on the backs of collars. Daniel, speaking of which, you went to Wembley on Saturday. Yeah, two hours off flag chat. It was yeah. nice to see some actual football. Uh, not a brilliant game or brilliant result, but there were mm. things to think about. In paper planes. Course. There were, yeah, there were certainly paper planes, MIA's paper planes, yeah. <laughs> nice. All right, well, we'll talk about that. Seb, we're obviously going to get your thoughts on the extraordinary Germany-France, well, France-Germany uh, result the other night as well, and loads of other things as well, including those Euro 2024 playoff finals, which are coming up on Tuesday. But let's begin with events at Wembley. 17-year-old uh, substitute Endrick settling the game with 10 minutes to go. Of course, he is Real Madrid bound. But in the meantime, what a game for him. What a game for who else? Daniel Story. What kind of a game was it? What a game for me, yeah. Um, it, it, was a, it was an emphatic international friendly. It, it was slow paced to start with and it was broken up by mistakes and sort of flashes of excellence i suppose um brazil were really good in the counter and i think the kind of overarching theme of the game is that everybody got what they wanted they wanted declan rice as the only holding midfielder so two adventurous central midfielders in in jude bellingham and conor gallagher the kind of runner and the the, the baller uh and it turns out if you only play one defense midfielder who also wants to surge forward like he does for arsenal then you leave a a slightly one pace central defence open to counter attacks. Um, I've long been a believer that playing two defensive midfielders is not defensive if it allows everybody else to play without the fear and stay up front and kind of press high without worrying about not winning the ball. And that basically seemed to be what happened. Um, Bellingham and Foden seem to occupy probably the same position. I think, it, if anything, it summed up just how important Harry Kane and Bakayo Saka are, both as a combination and, and as very complimentary this is intended as, but as place fillers, because Kane is, is the man up front. Saka is the man on the right. England basically didn't have a, a right side attack as soon as Kyle Walker went off because they brought on a central defender to fill in. And Foden and Bellingham didn't really want to go there. Gallagher tried. We won quite a lot of free kicks there, but nothing really happened from that side. And it left Anthony Gordon to try and do all of that by himself, which he wasn't really able to do. Um, I mean, by the end, England were pretty ramshackle. You know, you had Joe Gomez at left back, Esri Konza at right back. You had Miney making his debut. It looked after about 75 minutes that England were quite happy for the game to have ended at that point. You mentioned having Declan Rice as the sole defensive midfielder and... What were the other questions or the other issues going into this game for England? And to what extent have any of them been settled? I don't think any of them have been settled. It was one of those kind of classic nights where the people who aren't there um, put forward their case more than the people who are. I'm thinking of Luke Shaw over Ben Chilwell at left back because he struggled. Uh, I'm thinking of a another central midfielder, and it might well be Kobe Mainu if he starts against Belgium and does well. Kane and Saka, as I mentioned, both... <laughs> Both don't need their reputations enhancing, but probably were by what they saw. England have got a central midfield issue. Um, they've got a fullback problem, which is mad because it's only two years since we were all picking teams of 11 right backs that England could play. And suddenly we're a little bit unsure about the balance there. 
Um, and the questions about central defence don't really go away. Um, this will sound absolutely mad as a as a setup, but England played North Macedonia last year at home, and they played a central midfield of Trent Alexander Arnold, Jordan Henderson, and Declan Rice. And then before the game, everyone went mad on Twitter as they're prone to do, because we're playing three defensive midfielders against North Macedonia. What we're we doing? This is classic Southgate. And what actually happened is that England won 7-0 because the fullbacks could get forward and stay high. It was Walker and Shaw there who are mm. best. It, it was also North Macedonia. It was, but North Macedonia are, are... The point is that everyone says when England play weaker teams, that's when we should attack, 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 attack. Mm. But you don't, in international football, you don't just attack, attack, attack. You have a game plan that protects the weakest part of your side, which is central defence with protection. And you allow the strengths to be magnified by getting the fullbacks high, allowing Saka and Foden to come in field, get close to Kane, let Bellingham have some space to roam and to do exactly what he does. And to be fair, did again on Saturday night. He was England's best player. But it isn't defensive if it allows everyone else to fly. And we saw last night with just Rice there, he desperately wants to get on the ball and move forward when he gets it. But when he does that, he had periods of time when there was basically seven England players or six England players 40 yards from Brazil's goal. And then this massive gap to Harry Maguire and John Stones, who are, you know, their vibe is not defending with 40 yards of space in front of them. Mm. Seb, did you see this game? Yeah, I saw most of it, Jimbo. And I just want to pick up on something that Dan said, actually, because I, I think it's a, a disease that is shared by international teams across the world and that we get preoccupied with positions rather than roles within sides. And so... In England's case, we kind of look at the definition of those three players picked in midfield and we don't worry enough really about kind of what their function is within a team. And to me, that, that eight role with England has been a problem for a really long time because it's kind of, it's between Declan Rice and Jude Bellingham, there exists this kind of hinterland into which we just put a guy who is a sort of shuttler, a jack of all trades. And it, it doesn't ever feel like that role adds to the team composition um, in a particularly compelling way. I also, at times, I hate to say this, and I, I'm going to sound terribly negative. It felt like I'd woken up 15 years ago just in terms of watching England struggle with ball retention and what they did with it. It was like, when you, do you remember when, you, when you'd watch England back in those, you know, back after the, after the millennium turn, and you'd think they're kind of, they're doing an impression of a side who've been told to keep the ball and who, who understand that retention in international football is really, really important. And when you compare it with a Brazil, with a, um, a team who, I don't think Brazil are the very best team in the world at the moment, but there's a kind of a, a technical level, which I think England don't quite have in certain positions. It's quite unflattering and it alarmed me. Um, and I, actually, I think Dan hit the nail on the head. It was a game in which you learnt nothing in which you kind of felt better about nothing, in which you kind of reaffirmed your understanding that Kane is the reference point for so much of that attack. When nothing has really happened, you need the happening, you need the momentum, the little pulses of of influence that Bukai Saka can provide. And that defense is I, I I don't quite have the vocabulary for it because it, it's more it's it's more a lack of trust. You never really feel like you're gonna get through difficult times in a game where like you're you're being examined defensively. You never feel like that England defence is capable of surviving those periods without making a mistake or without giving up a chance. And that's it's quite concerning. The positive spin on that, and this is a, a kind of if everybody's fit, it, if everybody's fit and Kobe Minor impresses against Belgium and he becomes the de facto Jordan Henderson replacement, there is a situation where that works in that Stones and Walker really know each other. Maguire and Shaw really know each other. Minor is also... Manchester United and therefore takes the ball from them. Declan Rice has played a lot of caps now. He knows that role. I think there is a way that the, the two sides of that defence in possession are able to build. You saw it a little bit between Stones and Walker last night, that kind of pass, 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 and suddenly it's at Declan Rice's feet in 20 yards of space. It didn't happen often enough. But when players are absent, and mm -hmm. they've been very absent recently for England, we, we, we have, as much as you can have an injury crisis and for an international friendly, England kind of had one in this break without Saka and Kane. And with Shaw injured and with Walker going off there were, there were just too many pieces missing after the first 20 minutes of the game for even at that point I kind of felt like this is going to be a long 70 minutes to try and work out what happens One positive that you mentioned in your piece for the eye Daniel is that much like classic England-Brazil games of yore you had 
technically gifted attacking midfielders being rough towers by the opposition. Only nowadays, you know, the roles are reversed. It's the Brazilians <laughs> doing it to us, which is nice. What what other uh, glints of light could you see in amongst of all this? Anthony Gordon, how did you feel about his performance? Yeah, I, I think he played pretty well. I, I, I don't think he makes the, the starting team in the Euros by any means, because I think the way that Foden and Bellingham tend to operate to, in the same space um, means that you probably have to have Foden out on the left. Um, as long as Shaw's there to overlap, he can then dip in field and then Saka on the right stretches the game wide. What they were incapable of doing last night is stretching the game wide. So they ended up trying to stretch it from back to front. They tried to create the space in midfield by having the separate parts of the team a very long way away from each other. When Saka's there and he stays wide, England are really good at stretching the game wide. And what you have then is Kane is that focal point, like Seb says, in the middle. And you have Bellingham Push, running in from deep and Foden sort of op operates in that slightly position positionless position where he's out on the left but he's drifting in and and when it works and we play quickly it looks really really good and it's looked really really good recently look we should say this is the first game England have lost since the World Cup in 2022 they've beaten Italy home and away in that in that period of time they've looked really good for periods of time the problem is is that as we know with England when two steps forward is met by one step back. The one step back tends to linger in the national consciousness more than anything else. Does it really constitute a step back, though, if it's just a friendly against Brazil? Uh, I think it only... Now? I think it only does if if they lose to Belgium on Tuesday because Ooh. I don't I don't think managers always talk about these periods of time as as like when you're finding things out about players. And that's probably true, in, for example, with Minor and Gordon. But you also need to build up some momentum going into a national tournament. England have been very, very good under Southgate at building that momentum in a group stage, um, certainly at the last World Cup, certainly at World Cup 2018, less so in, in Euro 2020 because they were sluggish in that group stage, but then they kicked on in the, in the knockouts. But look, I, I have no, I don't think last night has any bearing on the Euros in any way. I think we are one of a number of teams that can win that tournament. I think it will be incredibly fine margins. There are doubts about England's game management if they go ahead. There are doubts about their ability to beat high-class opponents. But, yeah, Southgate for himself, for his own mood, I think could do with a, a decent win on Tuesday night. OK. Belgium then. Belgium on Tuesday night. Belgium, who haven't been beaten in 11 matches, are now under the tutelage of Domenico Tedesco, of course, are joining us to tell us a bit more on those bare facts. Christophe Terreur, how are you? I'm fine, and you? Yeah, very well. It's been a stressful week. We've been fretting over flags and being beaten by Brazil. What, what have you been worrying about in Belgium? Uh, not a lot. Only uh, it's yeah, it's cycling week. So in Belgium, ah. so everybody's worried about cycling, not about those friendly games of football. To be fair, okay. I was wondering about maybe the desecration of your national kit with that Tintin homage, where they got the color of the oh, trousers yeah, that, wrong. Yeah, but that was weeks before, so okay. uh, that, <laughs> it was already leaked a few weeks ago. So then the discussion was there. Were, a lot of people seem to seem to like it. So I like Belgium, it. Yeah. Although so, I do agree that they should have gone full kit and got the trousers in as well, being yeah. tucked in above the socks. And they should have should have hired Kevin De Bruyne as the model for the kit, so it would have been the right. complete the complete picture as he was uh, compared to Tintin when he was younger, right. when he still had another haircut, not the one he has now. So right, Mario Goetze was always my kind of go-to Tintin comparison, but I take your point. That works as well. Hey, here's something else you could be concerned about if it wasn't for all the cycling. Uh, the nil-nil with the Republic of Ireland this weekend. Yes, uh, I, I heard Robert, uh, let's say Roberto Tedesco already make a mistake that a famous TV reporter made when he interviewed him a few weeks ago. He called uh, um, Domenico Tedesco Roberto Tedesco, uh, like uh, you mix up the former manager with the, with the new manager. So Domenico Tedesco said that he was waiting for the final whistle for 90 minutes. So that's basically how everybody felt and watched that game. It was just a very dull and slow game. Yeah, with a with a team that has never played together. So you with players that some of them don't play a lot at their team. So it was just a little experiment. And uh, I always uh, see those stories, five things you learned from, uh, from a game. Maybe they should have done five things you didn't learn from this game because mm. yeah, there was not a, lo a lot to learn about, to be fair. Five things you could have been doing instead of watching this game. It could have gone worse for Belgium, though. 
Republic of Ireland with a penalty that was saved by Nottingham Forest's very own Matt Sells. But just going back to Belgium, the wildly disappointing, I think, for many of the Belgian performance back at the, the World Cup. And for those of us who haven't really been keeping tabs on the side since then, what kind of form is Belgium in with the Euros in prospect? Well, we've been fine in the qualification, but that, that was something that was already happening under Roberto Martinez, where we did were the champions of uh, of the qualification games. We won all. We always won everything, or we draw. We were always unbeaten. We're still unbeaten with Belgium, I think, in the, in the run of the Desco. So, uh, yeah, you don't know where you are basically until you've met the big guns at the tournament. I think. I think this team is uh, is far younger. Now we've lost, uh, if I can count, Toby Alderweireld at the back. We've lost Thibaut Courtois with a, after a row with uh, with Tedesco about the captain's uh, armband. We lost Axel Witzel. We lost Eden Hazard. So we lost a bit of yeah world-class quality of the team. We have some young guys, but they're not ready yet. And it's a bit of a chaotic team. We can hurt a lot of teams because the attack is quite good if you... Have Jeremy Doko if you have Romelu Lukaku in good form, if you have Kevin De Bruyne and uh, an unpredictable guy like Bakayoko who plays for PSV at the right, or Leandro Trossar of Arsenal, or uh, Luke Bakke of Sevilla. You have lots of players that can create something, but you're quite vulnerable at the back if Jan Vertonghen at the age of 37 is still your best defender you might have a problem, although Italians might say different because they uh, became uh, European champions a few years ago with all players at the back. So let's see. But yeah, the level is a bit lower than it was before. Uh, we are used to having like 18 players in the squad playing uh, for yeah the top five in the Premier League uh, uh, five years ago and uh, six years ago at the World Cup. Now they're all, most of them playing for relegation teams. So that's the big difference, I think. Mm. All right. Some exciting names in there, as you say. What, what do you think Tedesco is looking f- looking to find out from this game against England? Well, it might be the, the first real test for, for his side. We played Germany uh, a year ago. Um, that was basically the best football we've seen from Belgium in a, in a few years. Not anymore under Roberto Martinez since the World Cup. It was fast. It was... Yeah, they basically furious game when in the first half hour we scored three times against Germany. But then in the, the games after, you find out that Germany wasn't that good over the last year. So, yeah, maybe it will be the first test for, for this Belgian side. See uh, how stable our defense is against her. Yeah, we, we would shall call England a world class team. They have far more talent at the moment than we have. Or, uh, so, yeah, there will be the test for the defence, I think, basically. Uh, we still have, the, have no Kevin De Bruyne in the squad. He's, he's injured again, so he hasn't been there for a year now. So, yeah, we don't know where we are. And Robert, Romelu Lukaku, our second uh, big gun, um, is not 100% fit. I think he will play against England, but, yeah, uh, he's struggling with a, with a hip injury for weeks already. So, if you're both, if you're both top players now, I'm not. There are not top fits. Yeah, it's just a friendly game where you can find out some things, but we will only know how strong we are when uh, when we play with Kevin De Bruyne, I think. Okay. The issues with uh, Thibaut Courtois, who, who's likely to be the goalkeeper for Belgium at the Euros then? Well, it's Kuhn Castells of Wolfsburg. He, he always used to be the yeah, the better of Thibaut Courtois in the at at Genk uh, in the in the youth. So uh, he was a big prospect when he was a kid, but then he was always injured at the wrong time. Basically, he got a finger injury. Then Thibaut Courtois made his debut at the age of sixteen. He was uh, when yeah, one of the goalkeepers didn't have his his license due to tra- transfer issues uh, in the preseason. Kuhn Castell was injured. Thibaut Courtois got his chance at the age of 18 and yeah, since then he's, he's grown to, to be a top keeper in Castells. Yes, he hasn't made the career everybody yeah, expected of him. He moved to Hoffenheim in, in Germany, did well over there and then moved to Wolfsburg. But Wolfsburg is not the big, big side anymore when yeah, Kevin De Bruyne was there when they were still challenging for, for trophies. So he's a good goalkeeper, but 
he's been injured for the last week, so he has a shoulder injury. So not sure. It's not sure if he plays against England. Otherwise, if he won't be playing against uh, England, it will be uh, Nottingham's uh, Matt Sells again. So uh, good at penalties we've seen. So, uh, but Kunkastels will be normally number one. We had a huge uh, yeah discussion in Belgium a few weeks ago when. It's he, when uh, Milis Filar of AS Roma, he's, he's born in Belgium. He has a double nationality, uh, Serbia. He rejected the call up for, for Serbia. And everybody thought, oh, Milis Filar might join the Belgian team. We have our, our successor for Kurtois. But then uh, it was not possible to change nationalities again for him uh, at the age because he played an, an international game for, for Serbia after the age of. 22 and the rules have changed a few years ago so that's a shame but yeah that says everything about the goalkeeper discussion everybody's a bit doubting the goalkeepers at the moment is Castells good enough to replace Courtois no maybe you will prove everybody wrong at the, at the Euros but we'll have to see okay we will meanwhile Matt sells do you think on Tuesday Christoph thank you so much for that I uh, hope you enjoyed the uh, Tuesday evening and i look forward to catching up with you ahead of the euros this summer yes with kevin de bruyne and hopefully otherwise uh, we'll go out in the first uh, round or something christophe terreur on england's next opponents let's say I, I didn't think england were that bad in the first half against brazil and it, and it was brazil and all that daniel you were speaking to natalie jedra post game at wembley what what did she think well, we, yeah, we, we spoke more at half time when she, would, oh. she was pretty worried about, um, I think three of Brazil's back four had not played for their country before. And so she was worried about England threatening that back four and was pleasantly surprised that ha- that hadn't really happened. We should say if England have got an injury crisis and so do Brazil, they're basically missing their spine in terms of Neymar and Casemiro and Thiago Silva. None of those three were there. Um, and they they played pretty well. I, I mean, I, I think if Harry Kane had been playing, England probably would have taken the lead before Brazil did. Um, but Endrick became the story, which was really nice. You know, he 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 is so small when he came on the pitch. I know Mainu is small, and that was vaguely amusing as well. But he, his the best way I can describe it is that Endrick's shorts and the Brazil shorts are big and very very bright white. His shorts look bigger than his shirt, which is just. A mad thing to see but yeah he took his goal really well uh the brazil fans at that end of wembley where he scored were really good all night they went mad all night and yeah they kind of had their moment it was it was it was brilliant for him he's obviously a, a superstar talent he's already got the move so we don't even need to kind of talk about him and kind of remember the name i think everyone's been doing that since he was about 12. um but yeah he he, he took the goal really well and and it his in his arrival into the game seemed to spark Brazil in a way that hadn't really happened before. They weren't really in the game. Vinicius is kind of going through this thing with Brazil where he's kind of desperate to impress and it's just he says it's just not working. I've not I've played really badly for the national team. I, I need to do better. And he was almost trying to take that on himself last night. I thought him and Lucas Paqueta were the, the standout players. Paqueta in the first half, largely because he was seemed to be trying to break Jude Bellingham's shins but also because he played a couple of beautiful passes he kind of does this thing where he just turns and then passes straight away and surprises a defence he did that for for one chance that that set Brazil through on goal um yeah they were better than I thought they would be Brazil last night because it was it was such a changed team it was such a, a young team in terms of international experience but you look at that and Seb was talking earlier about like England lacking that eight like Brazil had Bruno and Paqueta, who are basically both exactly what England need in that role. Either of them would be fine, please. Because, yeah, they, they have this way of dominating the ball and buying time for their teammates and picking the right decision every time that Conor Gallagher is game without the ball, but doesn't really do in the same way with it. Mm. Well, Brazil, of course, have their own big summer tournament coming up. It is the Copa America, which saw this weekend the last couple of nations qualifying. Canada... Uh, managed to get past Trinidad and Tobago to qualify for their first ever Copa America. Costa Rica took the last place with a 3-1 win over Honduras. Lovely stuff. Tim Vickery was tweeting that Endrick came out, came off the field and uh, cited Bobby Charlton in his reaction to scoring at Wembley, which is quite a thought, given that he's, what, 17? 
Yeah, he also, um, there's quotes from him about Chelsea as well, kind of very mm. much talking up like English Premier League heritage and big London clubs. And I sort of thought, uh, talk about a guy that's running quick before he walks because he's not even joined Real Madrid yet. That's the, that's the good stuff, talking about a move <laughs> before you've even gone to Real Madrid. Well, supposedly he, he could have gone to Chelsea a, yes. uh, not long ago. But, uh, um, the Bewley administration in its wisdom felt that was in no way. I think if you are a young Brazilian player, then Real Madrid just becomes your destination now because it's socially, it's easier to make the adjustment. And you, you have so many players who've kind of trodden that path before and overcome the expectation of moving to a club like that straight out of Brazil. Vinicius is a great example. I, we, we knew about Vinicius, well, I think when he was 15 years old and everybody heard about this guy who could never possibly be worth the money. And it was one of those, you know, every now and again, football has one of those moral panics over transfer fees for young players every now and again, every every other week. And Vinicius was a classic example. So obviously their, their scouting network through Jan Calafat is, is well known, but you have a kind of community that you can step right into as a Brazilian player. And so you know, to go there makes sense. I mean, I applaud him for looking that far down the line to kind of plotting where he goes next and, you know, maybe preempt his celebration of future teams, you know, not celebrating <laughs> too much against Chelsea in the Champions League possibly. But... Yeah, it's a it's a kind of it becomes a sort of self fulfilling situation though, which um, yeah, it's uh, pretty handy when you're dealing with that kind of talent. Indeed, so very good. Uh, look forward to seeing more from him. England against uh, England against Belgium on Tuesday. Also that night, there's going to be the Euro 2024 playoff finals. So let's get on to them next. Tuesday brings the three finals with three places up for grabs at this summer's Euro Championships at five o'clock. UK time, there's Georgia against Greece. Then you've got Ukraine against Iceland. And in Cardiff, Wales against Poland. Joining us now from the Principality, Tom Williams. Hello, James. Williams the Thomas. Williams the Thomas coming to you live from sunny Roson Sea on the, uh, the glorious North Wales coast. Oh, magnificent. All right. Tom, you also join us from a very happy place. One game from another major continental tournament. Yes, indeed. Um, yeah, victory over Poland on Tuesday and Wales will be will be back at another major tournament. And I, mm. I think a, a feature of the last few years with the Welsh national team has, has just been thinking that, you know, this is, this is fun while it lasts. It won't last forever. And I think if you go back to the World Cup, you know, Wales obviously qualified first time since 1958 and all that, but was so bad. And I don't think anyone um, really enjoyed Wales's performances in Qatar. I don't think any Wales fans did. And there was a real feeling of an end of an era. You know, Gareth Bale announces his retirement shortly afterwards. Aaron Ramsey had quite a poor tournament. Rob Page is kind of limping on in the in the dugout. And it, it did feel like, you know, things had had reached... Um, had reached a kind of end point and yet you know here we are 18 months on or, or whatever it is and there's a there's a freshness there's a vibrancy and there's a, and there's a you know a new group of players who are who are leading this team forward mm, indeed well let's talk about the game the other night still a little bit hoarse from the Finland encounter uh, Wales powering pass thanks to Brennan Johnson and David Brooks Nika Williams Daniel James and Reese Ifans of course as well Yes, yeah. As someone on Twitter pointed out, Wales are in very real danger of running out of Welsh actors to deliver rousing pre-match speeches. I think one suggestion was that we might have to start running through the cast of Fine and Sam. Uh, but yes, Rhys Evans was uh, was was on hand to to do the honours prior to the Finland game. I must admit, I was relatively optimistic prior to the Finland game because I mean, you know, Finland hadn't looked particularly brilliant in, in qualifying. I suppose you could probably say the same thing about Wales. Uh, but, you know, home advantage once again. Uh, fantastic atmosphere at, at Cardiff City Stadium. Dream start to the game. David Brooks volleying Wales ahead in the third minute after Harry Wilson's shot had been saved. Um, and I think Wales generally controlled most of the game from that point on. Um, you know, got a second goal. Nico Williams, lovely free kick into the top right corner from... Harry Wilson's layoff, uh, and then Finland scored right on half time. You know, worst possible time. Team of Bookie sneaks in and, and slots one past Danny Ward. So there was a you know a degree of 
degree of nervousness during the halftime interval. Um, but then, you know, Wales get a third goal through Brennan Johnson right at the start of the second half. And then, it, you know, f- from that point on, it was very comfortable. Dan James comes on, runs through, uh, rounds the keeper to, to, to score the fourth. Um, and yeah, pretty straightforward evening, really. And, and you know, obviously now uh, the the terrain will become a little bit steeper with with Poland uh, coming to town. But I think, you know, given given the, the way that, that Wales played, home advantage again, the fact that these players, you know, just despite it being a very young squad, have, have got so much experience of these kinds of games. I, you know, I think there, there is a real, there, there's, a, there's a real optimism, uh, you know, going into this game again. Mm. Yeah, well, two years ago, we were having this conversation prior to Ukraine, no? And that all went okay. And three, you went to the World Cup, where in a group of England and Iran and USA, you took one point. This time, getting past Poland would earn you a place alongside Austria, the Netherlands and France. Quite the prospect. You do have to get past Poland, who, dating back to 2001, you've played them six times and you've lost to all of them. That's probably why I don't remember them. I've I've probably made a you know a, a conscious or perhaps uh, unconscious decision to to block out those memories. Why do you think this might be different? Because um, I'm just looking at the dates of those games, and most of them were in the, the dark days of the you know the, the pre the pre Gary Speed uh, Chris Coleman eras. Um, we did lose to them twice in the Nations League. I know, yeah, no recollection of those games whatsoever. Uh, I, I think because you know there is there's a new dynamic to this to this Wales team, and and I you know there's there's a real sort of um, you know consistency and, and continuity in terms of selection. You know, you look at the team that started against Finland on Thursday, and on paper it was a very young team, but you know Ethan Ampadu was winning his fiftieth cap at the age of only twenty three, and that's because you know these young players were blooded a long time ago and, and you can go all the way back to the, the John Toshak era um, when you know players like Gareth Bale and, and Aaron Ramsey were getting their first opportunities in, in the first team. Wales have given opportunities to young players as quickly as possible. Um, you know, cynics might suggest that it's also to make sure they don't end up playing for England or someone else who they might be eligible for at international level. But it means that you know you you get these players, many of whom are you know are only playing championship football uh, and many of whom are very young, but have a huge weight of international experience behind them. Um, and I think what, is, what has particularly changed for Wales in the last few months, you go back to last year, some really disappointing results in qualifying, you know, losing at home to Armenia. Um, and then this miraculous win over Croatia in October that just you know, completely transformed the qualifying campaign. Um, but what has changed even since then is that almost all of Wales's most important players are now playing regular football. A lot of them have had to drop down to the championship, um, you know, in, in search of football. You look at the Leeds contingent, you know, Joe Rodon, Ethan Ampadu, Connor Roberts, Daniel James, they're all getting regular football. David Brooks is getting regular football with Southampton. Kiefer Moore is getting regular football and banging the goals in with Ipswich. And, um, you know, Aaron Ramsey didn't feature against Finland he was on the bench he's you know he's he's working his way back after a knee injury but you don't feel like Wales are, are dependent on him in the way that they once were um you know obviously not dependent on Gareth Bale anymore either but there's this this you know this this new this new group of players who've who've come through and you know that they're all playing regular football they're pretty much all in decent form and and it gives you know Rob Page a bit of a bit of a selection headache um uh, you know, when it comes to, to sending his team out. So, yeah, I, I, I feel like that there is, even compared to, you know, the, the positive results Wales had towards the back end of last year, there's 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 even greater competition for places now. Um, and the fact that no one's really talking about whether or not Ramsey's going to start against Poland shows the, the position of strength that, that Wales are in. You know, we played with a midfield pairing of 23-year-old Ethan Ampadu and 19-year-old Jordan James against Finland, and they were both absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, you've you've got Wilson, you've got Johnson, you've got um, you know David Brooks, and 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 all the rest of them. So yeah, I mean, it's all very positive. Excellent, Tom. You're going along to the game Tuesday. Yes, I will be there uh, on Tuesday in the Ninian Stand uh, in what is what has become my habitual habitual spot. Very nice. Well, best of luck. I hope it goes well for you, and we'll catch up with you soon. Yes. Well, I think I'll catch up with you on Thursday, James. So we'll, ah, we'll be excellent. able to post. We'll be able to post mortem things in uh, 
in, in great detail. Very good news, Tom. Uh, enjoy Tuesday. Thanks for being with us today. All right. Also on Tuesday, as mentioned, you've got Georgia against Greece and Ukraine versus Iceland, which is taking place in Rotslav, Poland. What a turnaround for Ukraine in their semi-final against Bosnia-Herzegovina. Yeah, late, 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 late goals. And yeah, I mean, we had this with with the World Cup playoff when Wales played Ukraine. This is obviously, for, for very obvious non-sporting reasons, there's this sort of rush of goodwill that Wales managed to trample all over and, and kind of fair play to them. But I think now Iceland kind of had their moment in 2016. I think pretty much everyone's behind Ukraine getting to this Euros. It would be a, a brilliant statement. Um, and they look good at the moment. They look kind of they, the team that got dismantled by by England at Euro twenty twenty is um, seems to have had this sort of overhaul. And yeah, I don't know if it's if it's driven by patriotic pride. I'm sure it is. But there's also a heck of a lot of talent in that Ukraine team. I really hope they make it because they won't okay. be a. When you see them attack, Dan, that there really is a lot of talent. Like I, I know that we know Modric obviously because of. Um, the big transfer to Chelsea and uh, Dovbeck because of uh, his season at Girona, but Georgi Sudakov behind them, um, like he's, uh, you see the fees connected with him. And I, I, I saw him play a couple of times in the Champions League, um, because Shakhtar play that or played their games in, in Hamburg this season for obvious reasons. And if you can get that firing, I mean, it's not a huge surprise. I, I, I read before you started recording, they only lost to Italy and England in 2023. And if you think back to that, second leg playoff game against Italy in Leverkusen really they should have had a penalty at the end of it and they were probably the better team throughout um they drew against Germany they beat North Macedonia in North Macedonia which is um which is no mean feat um they're talented so they're they're this obviously a you know a, a story that everybody can get behind but you really wouldn't want to face them at this stage of a qualification campaign mm. Iceland have Albert Gudmundsson Meanwhile, he might be commanding big transfer fees of his own this summer. Uh, been a bit of a breakout star this season for Genoa. And he continued that in their 4-1 win in their semi-final against Israel. Played in Budapest, again, for obvious reasons. Uh, notching up a hat trick. Uh, anyway, there you go. That's the game at night. Sorry, 7.45 on Tuesday. A couple of hours before that, Georgia faced Greece. A game which you're quite invested in, Daniel. Yeah, I... I, I spent some time with with a guy called David Webb who's one of the assistant coaches for for Willie Sagnol um the Georgia manager now and I mean the country in general is is really investing in football it's used the Nations League um to not miraculous effect but certainly to fairly seismic effect they are now in League B which is England's league they got promoted out of D and got promoted out of C in both campaigns they won five and drew one um that league that they got just got promoted out. They, they dismantled Bulgaria, for example, who were not what they were. But this idea that Europe's minnows is beyond maybe two or three very obvious nations now is, is absolutely right. Georgia are there to, to make up the gap. I really hope they beat Greece because I'm in the nicest possible way. I'm sick of watching Greece draw nil nil major tournament matches live. Um, and yeah, I just think that, that there's this, yeah, there's this huge movement behind Georgian football at, at the moment. Not, not obviously not least because of Kvaradona, but also because the squad is now filled with players who are at decent clubs at decent level and getting minutes at those clubs as well. They they joint hosted the, Euro, the European Under Twenty One Championships last summer. They've you know they invested in stadiums for that. Um, David Webb says that it's not quite Premier League facilities, but it's it's not far off. It's it the structure is there for Georgia to bridge the gap, and something like the Nations League makes a huge difference because. It will be years, maybe even decades, before they have a chance, a serious chance in regular qualifying. But they've already, they, you know, they've lost one Euro playoff final. They're desperate not to lose another. They will be second favourites against Greece, but they're also at home, which will make a fairly big difference in Tbilisi. It's sixty thousand people. It's a mad atmosphere. So, yeah, the, uh, I'd like them in Ukraine to win, please. Mm. I I felt terribly sorry for Luxembourg in that playoff. Georgia played very well, and they probably deserved it, but. Luxembourg, a kind of, I would even say, a sort of a, a mirror image of the journey that that Georgia have been on. They were, they were ranked 195th, so that's kind of between countries like Montserrat and American Samoa. American Samoa of 31 nil fame, 
And really, um, Georgia played well and they did deserve to win, but really should have been down to 10 men in the first half, in my opinion. I thought that was pretty poorly officiated. Uh, they too have invested in young players. They, they've got a sort of a, a campaign to gather all the best six, seven-year-old players in the country in a kind of a central academy system. So they're really trying to kind of move up the ladder and they're a great success story as well for them to, to get so close to a to a a major competition and then to kind of be let down by officials is it's got to be a pretty bitter pill to swallow mm. um the Greece thing I, I was I was reading up on this apparently Gus Poyet who first of all didn't really know that Gus Poyet was coaching Greece uh his contract runs out in five days time did we know that good lord I was not yeah. aware of that so this is kind of pretty pivotal for him and, and they haven't mm. they haven't been I think they've been to one European championship since they won it and that was back in they got to the quarterfinals in 2012. They've been to one World Cup. The last World Cup they were at was 2014. So this would be a pretty big moment for them too. And obviously, uh, it's kind of further employment or bust for Poya by all accounts. So a yeah, strange situation if you've got sort of four days left on the job before you uh, you know, either go to a European Championship or you find yourself somewhere else to, to work. Well, I guess the timing makes sense from the point of view they might be out of contention for the Euros post-Tuesday. And therefore, time to time to make that change. But, By the way, for all that nil nil fame that Daniel was referencing, <laughs> five nil their win against Kazakhstan last Thursday. They were four nil up at half time. So uh, maybe Poyet this is ball. it. Maybe mm. it's Gus Poyet, it's Kevin Keegan entertainers, and I've I've got them all wrong. The, the, all, all, all of the goals they scored, barring the penalty, were kind of the same. They all came from the right side against Kazakhstan. They all came from crosses not being cut out or not or space not being taken away. So it wasn't. I think Kazakhstan would probably claims to be better than they showed, uh, but Greece were pretty good. They, um, mm. they. I just, it, it, if you schedule someone's contract to, uh, to coincide with non qualification for a tournament, isn't that quite negative? Like, well, we we won't well, need to employ you beyond that because you know there's there's no need. It's it doesn't. I don't know. Does that fire you up? Well, we'll see if it works. <laughs> Perhaps it does. Everything on the line. I'll remind uh, you of of this Greece loving horrible agenda yeah. yeah when <laughs> when the group stage comes around and you're all being sick because they've drawn nil nil with Czech yeah, if, if, if they get one. through yeah. potentially in a group with turkey as well which would be yeah, a pretty Portugal, feisty turkey old, uh, and fixture. It, geopolitically as you say the most sensitive one there yeah remarkable stuff though from georgia 10 years ago they were ranked 154th in the world directly behind vietnam and guyana and they're now 90 minutes or perhaps a few more from reaching the European Championships. Excellent. Full-time Europe, the Athletics Women's Football Podcast will be out on Tuesday. It was a big weekend in the WSL, as you probably know. Derby's in Liverpool and Manchester, where Man City women made it 11 WSL wins in a row with a 3-1 win over their United counterparts. Loads on that then in full-time Europe. What else happened this weekend? Oof, Leicester City. Now officially charged by the Premier League with breaking spending rules during the last three seasons in the top flight. Foxes could now face a points deduction next season. And uh, they're also subject of a separate financial probe from the EFL, presumably what, relating to their current activities in the Championship. Is that right? Yeah, and they, they haven't submitted their accounts. I mean, this is a very, very simplified version of it, but it does sort of sound to the layperson like, they're saying to the Premier League, well, we're in the FL, and they're saying to the FL, well, all those punishments were when we're, from when we're in the Premier League. So, ha, checkmate. Checkmate, indeed. Uh, meanwhile, on a happier note, congratulations to Chesterfield, who confirmed promotion from the National <laughs> League back to the EFL on Saturday by beating Bournemouth 3-0. That's my little homage to Chesterfield manager Paul Cook. He of the extraordinary uh, octavial range in post-game interviews. Uh, is this something that you'd previously taken note of, Seb, Daniel? The the kind of the, the Jeff Buckley of non-league English football with his, mm. his octave leap. Uh, yeah, well, I, 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 I'm interested to hear an explanation for it more than anything mm. else. Um, Daniel? I have no explanation other than it is magnificent. I'm hoping, I'm actually hoping to go and see Chesterfield this week. All being okay, well. cool. So I, I mean, that's question number one. If so. Well, you'll you'll have watched the post game interview this Saturday, and just to underline, remarkable they they got promotion back to the EFL 
on the 23rd of March. That's how much they've dominated the National League. Now, other friendlies. France faced Germany Saturday evening. And Seb, just when everyone else thought it was safe to go to a Euros in Germany, the Mannschaft is back. Be very careful. Hey, Jimbo, the thing about this, though, is that... Mm. And this really describes how fragile Germany is feeling about its football. On Saturday evening, everyone was very, very happy. Best German performance they've seen in ages. Well done, Julian Nagelsmann. Let's applaud the, the the meritocracy involving all these Stuttgart players. Tony Cruz is back. Fantastic. By Sunday morning, the lead headline on Bild was, were we that good, question mark, or were France bad? And so it had, the, some of the optimism had been, had been wound back just a little bit. But hey, they were excellent. They really were. There were there were some flaws. Uh, there were a few moments when Kylian Mbappe and Osman Dembele were a little bit menacing around the flanks against Joshua Kimmich and Maxi Middlestad. But the roots of Nagelsmann's football were there. The ball movement was very, very good. The front three in particular. So Nagelsmann started with Kai Havertz playing a sort of a, I suppose you probably call it a false nine because he did a lot of drifting with Florian Wirtz and Jamal Musiala playing behind as a kind of a dueling number 10 system. Worked fantastically well. Havertz played beautifully, dropping off the play, passing the ball really nicely. Um, Wirtz, to me, is he's at that stage of his career where people still don't quite appreciate how good he is. Uh, he's been wrapped up in the Leverkusen story. He's a kind of a, a character within that tale rather than a, you know, a player in his own right. Uh, he was fabulous against France, scored an excellent goal. Um, played with this kind of, you know, and players were able just to to speed up a game, slow it down, play at their own speed, make it look quite easy, play on the transition, do all the things that you'd want to see in a Nagelsmann system. And yeah, they were excellent. They they also um, one of the the better stories from it was the the fullback Maxi Mittelstadt, who is a beneficiary of what Stuttgart have been able to do this season under Sebastian Hoeneß. Um, they've been excellent, but his journey over the past year has been amazing. So go back to 2023 and he was part of a Hertha Berlin side who were circling the drain and heading down the Bundesliga plug hole. And no one saw him as anything other than a future Zweider Bundesliga fullback. So much so that when he left Hertha in the summer, it was for half a million euros, came to Stuttgart with nobody really paying any attention. And it's been reinvented as this... Um, He's not a dynamic player. He's not a sort of a left-sided Carl Walker type. He doesn't have pace. And to be fair, that was something that Dembele exploited a little bit in the friendly uh, in Lyon. But um, can play internally, can pass the ball, can be part of the sort of the build-up phases that Germany have lacked in their, their chance creation over the last few years. Because the big issues affecting German the German national team, um, under the umbrella of... Uh, the German people being massively disinterested in it as it becomes less and less successful is chance creation, can't score goals, no number nine, can't defend. Uh, also, permanent crisis about whether Manuel Neuer or Mark andre Schagen should be, should be playing goal. Right. And for the first time, really, mm. on Saturday night, that story moved forward. You could envisage a, a situation where Germany don't maybe win the European Championship, but they're a problem. They're not going to be a source of embarrassment in the kind of the in the sense that the Deutsche Bahn doesn't work and here's another thing we've got to worry about because we might humiliate ourselves on, on the world stage. They were very, very good and um, they deserve all their praise, uh, all the praise they're receiving. And no, France weren't terrific. France were, you know, what they are uh, outside of tournaments. But it was really, really encouraging. OK, and it started early, didn't it? Seven seconds into the game, Florian <laughs> Wirtz scoring. And it, this wasn't an accident, Ted. No accident, Jimbo. Jamal Musiala was talking to the media afterwards and he said that um, one of their coaches, who's a, a specialist in creating automatisms within within open play, had kind of put it to the players on Friday. This is what we're going to do from kickoff. We're going to get it to Tony Cruz, which is a pretty good starting point, isn't it? One of the best passes in world football. Uh, he's going to find Florian Wirtz and then it's going to be kind of, right, Flo, do your worst. And that's that's how Musiala put it. And it, it worked because it well, was, it was so pretty So the effective. plan was... Pass to Florian Watson, see if he can score a goal. See if he can score a goal. That, right, that okay. seemed to be... So you, you, you could probably find more complex strategies, but is, you can't is really that argue a, with it. That's what specialists in creating automatisms? Automatisms. It's like Automatism. if, jo if John McKenzie was here, that's what yeah. he would call it. So I'm doing my what, best what impression it, of him. What does it mean? It means you kind of... 
within open play, you have set passages. So mm. you might have a situation where, I don't know, for instance, you're trying to push a winger into space or fall back into space. So a ball might be planned to go in, into midfield and then be swept out to the flank by uh, like a, an Andrea Perlo type. So there are little moments in the game which are kind of um, like strategies that repeat and repeat. So think of Antonio Conte's football. That's a really mm. good example of sort of loads of circuits, loads of the same thing happening again and again and again. Um, and this was just one of those. This was a kind of... Um, we're going to put Wirtz into space. We're going to put him 25, 30 yards away from goal. And we're going to ask him to do his worst. And he did. And um, I have to say, like, I, I, I thought of Dan because Bryce Samba played in goal for France. And he was absolutely excellent. He made three or four of the best saves I saw all weekend. And um, should have paid him, Dan. <laughs> yeah, the one that got it. I mean, it's, the, the good thing yeah. is, is that Forrest is very much doing this sort of Panini sticker album of European goalkeepers now. So we've already had him we're, we're, we're working through Belgium now with Matt Sells and Greece as well of Vlaki Kodimos and yeah never mind the one that got away I, I was about to say on, on that early goal this is a, a bit of a hot take but 152 years of international football for both the, the fastest and the <laughs> second fastest goals of all yeah. time in international football to be on the same day that's like the most incredible quirk of fate in football history surely it's is is there something behind it or do you think it really is just a, an enormous coincidence the other goal that you referenced took place a couple of hours before the Wurz goal and it was Christoph Baumgartner for Austria scoring after six seconds against Slovakia yeah I mean I suppose if you overanalyze it you'd say well if you're a manager international manager you might say it's a friendly they might switch off during the first six seconds not expecting something mad to happen um but and and i think you'd also say if you were being a, a cynic and a critic you'd say why are you using that up in a international friendly <laughs> save that for the first group stage of the euros um but i just yeah that's the most astonishing fact i can think I, of i'm gonna um i'm gonna make a very tenuous leap which doesn't bear any scrutiny at all but um both teams one coached by Julian Nagelsmann, the other coached by Ralph Rannick, both high priests of vertical transition football. I don't think that stands up to any sort of analysis, but it kind of, it, it adds into the kind of coincidence, right? It, I can't imagine two more managers in the world who would be more pleased with that coming off than those two. Put it oh, Ran, Rannick's effect on Austria is, is amazing. I, um, I did a bit of work a couple of months ago and obviously like, Obviously, sort of, he's the beneficiary of having a lot of players who have either played within the Red Bull system or have been exposed to tenets of Red Bull football. But like socially, if you look at kind of the attendance of national team games, it's gone through the roof. Um, it wasn't so long ago that that big sinkhole uh, appeared within the Austrian national stadium um, during an international break, which is kind of a handy metaphor for where they are under Franco Foda. So you've, you've changed from being this a team which had attacking players, but preferred to play a counter-attacking, carrying, very, very conservative style of play to something much more modern and recognisable and something which also, I suppose, if you were Austrian, would inspire a little bit more of an emotional response from you if you're watching it. It'd be good for Jim Radcliffe to watch the Euros and pick between Southgate and Rangnick as his next Manchester United manager, won't it? It's a good idea, Daniel. Uh, Germany, meanwhile, are going to be hosting the Netherlands on Tuesday, which is another big fixture. We'll see what the headlines are like after that one. Seb, the Dutch, who of course saw off Scotland Friday night 4 0, although that scoreline. The Scotland were better than them that, a little Jimbo. bit. Mm. And yeah. this was a. If you were to imagine a Ronald Koeman coach team with a lot of talent playing beneath themselves, this is what that game looks like. Because okay. they, they really weren't that good. They're, they're an awful lot of very, very talented players in that group. But um, I, I've never been particularly enraptured by what they've done under, under Koeman. Um, but I thought Scotland deserved a little bit better than a 4 0 thumping. Um, they played okay. better than that. All right. It was a wonderful goal from Rangers, though. Sure was. It sure mm. was. Yeah. In terms of wonderful goals, you'll also no doubt have seen uh, Daniel Munoz for Colombia against Spain in a game that weirdly took place at the London Stadium in East London. And did you catch the Damashan goal for Moldova against North Macedonia? No, sir. Or do? North Macedonia won, Moldova won, and Vitali Damashan with the standout goal, I would say, of the, of the weekend. Can you describe yeah. it? Can you no. 
Because <laughs> do you know what? As I was saying, I'm thinking, I can't actually remember what this looks like. Just that it was amazing. <laughs> so good. I think it's really, really, really curling. Right. But uh, there were a lot of goals by players that I wasn't 100% familiar with in games, which I'm not sure that I've fully filed properly in my head. It's one the, of those. I'm going to go and check it out. The Minos goal was lovely. Behind, you saw oh, the yeah. kind of Colombians fans. So the, the goal itself was, was fantastic, mm. of course, but the kind of the response to it was not very friendly like, which is exactly what you want to see, right? And it was, um, yeah, it was impassioned. It was excellent. One other thing we should mention Portugal, if they're on your radar as potential threats this summer in Germany, they took on Sweden this weekend. They beat them 5 2. They won all of their last 11 matches under Roberto. Martinez, so yeah, keep an eye on them. Magnificent. That's the international break so far. Obvs Tuesday's going to see some mighty games, and we will be catching up on the results of those in Thursday's show. So do hope you'll be returning for that, listener. Many thanks in the meantime to Daniel and Seb, Christoph and Tom, and producer Charlie for making today possible. Hope you have a splendid rest of your weekend stroke start of your week. And we'll catch up with you Thursday. The Totally Football Show podcast is available three times a week, bringing you all the football news you could reasonably be expected to care about. We've got views, we've got stats, we've got analysis, we've got some of the best football writers around, and the whole thing is absolutely free. So have a listen on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or all the usual places by clicking on the link below.